Well, hello and a very warm welcome to uh, NBCF at Home. It's great to have you with us. This is our online service. This is where we can uh, join together virtually online uh, and enjoy God's presence together, to worship together uh, and to hear from God's word. So we're so grateful you're joining us today. Why don't you grab yourself a cuppa or something and we'll be back in just a second with our service. Well, welcome back. Great to see you. Uh, great to have you with us. Uh, do comment. Do let us know that you're watching. Uh, do send us an email if we haven't met you before. We'd love uh, to hear with you, to know who's watching with us. And if you've been watching with us for a while and you live locally, uh, we just want to let you know that we meet at North Berwick High School at 10.30 uh, on Sunday mornings. And you would be very welcome to show up anytime. Um, you'll find us to be very welcoming uh, and uh, We'd love to see you there. So um, before we have a time of worship and then we're going to go into our, our message today, uh, I just wanted to share uh, a few verses with us that I've just been thinking through. And uh, it's from Philippians. It's Philippians 2, um, verse, from verse 5 uh, through to verse 7. And it says this, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. I love this passage because it, it challenges our ideas of what it means to be God. Uh, and you know we know that Jesus uh, was the son of God. He was God incarnate, God in the flesh. And yet what we learn from this passage is that he wasn't the kind of God who uh, liked to use his power to kind of gain uh, advantage for himself to make sure that he wins. He was the kind of God who rather laid down some of those privileges. He made himself like nothing, taking on the nature of a servant, it says. And, and I just find that incredible because when we think about the idea of God, we so often think about big, strong, mighty, powerful but do we think about the kind of God who comes to serve, to wash people's feet, to get down in the dirt with those that are hurting? And I find that just uh, such a beautiful and encouraging picture of what God is like. So just wanted to encourage you with that today. And I guess the challenge in the verse is just the, the beginning where it says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, that we are called to live out that kind of radical kingdom love where we uh, don't use any power or authority we have uh, for our own gain, but rather to serve other people. Uh, so maybe this week there's someone you could serve. You could use the gifts, the talents, the things God's given you to serve someone near you. So we're just going to have a, a song of worship now. So let me just pray as we come into worship. Lord, we thank you so much for your presence we thank you that even when we're in our homes, you can make yourself known to us. And we invite you to do that now. We have just read about how wonderful you are as, a, as the kind of God who comes to serve and come low and meet with us in our brokenness. And God, we invite you to do that. And we come to worship you for who you are, that beautiful image of who you are. Amen. Let's worship together.
Okay, so today we're, we're going to be talking about this whole idea of being friends of God. What does it mean to be friends of God? Now, this is a massive topic and once again just uh, covering the surface level in many ways today. Uh, but perhaps when you reflect on your own walk with God, you think of the times where it's felt like God has been a friend. The times where perhaps things have been difficult and, and you've just sensed him near you. Or perhaps it's where you've pray, prayed and you've seen answers to prayer. And we talked uh, just a couple of weeks ago about this idea of, of being transformed in his presence. And one of the, the ways in which God comes to us and makes himself known is, is through uh, encounters, through God making himself real. Uh, maybe it's in times of prayer, maybe it's in times of worship, where God just makes himself real. And I, I think I shared with you uh, one of those uh, moments for me when I was, uh, if you remember the story, I was in Kenya leading worship, and I just sensed God say to me, uh, do you not think I could do this without you? And it was, it was an invitation for me to understand that, that he was asking me to partner with him, to understand. And that reshaped my whole thinking about what it means to, to be a child of God, to understand that he actually invites me to work with him. He, he, of course, he could do it on his own, but he invites me in. And I think of other moments in my life as I reflect on times where God has been so real to me like a friend. I remember um, just being in a time of prayer and God just giving me a picture. And it was a really simple picture of me sitting on the edge of the water, maybe on a, a kind of bank, a raised bank, sitting on the edge of the water with my feet in the water. And, and in this picture, Jesus was sitting next to me doing the same uh, and we put our feet in the water and we just splashed. And he says, well, let's make some ripples together. And it was the most simple of pictures, but it tell you the impact it had on my life. This, this idea that he was like, let's make some ripples together. Like, let's, let's do something together. And that's the sense of God being our friend. So we're going to read um, some verses from John's gospel here. So let me give you a little bit of context. It's in John 15, if you're, if you're looking it up. I think we have it on the screen as well. But the context here is this whole section of John's gospel from 14, 15, 16, 17. It all happens in what's sometimes called the, the upper room. It all happens in this big, long conversation and dialogue and interaction with Jesus and his disciples before he goes to the cross. It's an uh, intimate time. He talks about the plans for the future. He talks about the Holy Spirit coming. And all of that is happening in the context of this meal that they're sharing together, this last supper, this intimate setting. And just before um, this section here that we're about to read, um, what's happened is that Judas has, has, Jesus turns to Judas and says, do what, you've, what you need to do. And everyone else thinks it's maybe to go and buy some more food or whatever, but actually Judas is off to betray him. So in this context, Judas has just left. We're in a place now of intimacy. It's the, it's the disciples and Jesus before he goes to the cross. So let me just read these words now from John 15, verses 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And I appear to have missed out the last part of my... Oh, there we are. Uh, I don't have it on my notes, though, so I'll read it on here. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Now, it's just an incredible passage. 
Um, there's just so much in it. So what we're going to do, right, is I'm going to read it through one more time. Um, and then um, as we're reading it through this time, I'd like you to think about what is it that stands out to me from this passage. There's a lot in it. But we'll go back to the beginning. Thanks, Norman. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Okay, I'd like to do something a little bit different now. If you're a guest, you get off the hook here. You can just talk about the weather, but I'd like you to turn to someone next to you and just say what stood out to you from that passage today. I know it's controversial. I'm asking you to talk in church. Yeah, you're probably all thinking there's far too much in there because almost every, every little sentence, there's something of huge depth. And, uh, and, and I think when you put it in the context of that kind of intimate setting, this is before Jesus goes to the cross, it just carries that, that extra weight. Like this is Jesus. These are the things I want you to remember you know, you know, when people say like their last words, their final words, it's like, pay attention to this. And there's, I mean, there's so much that we could pull out from this passage, and we're going to kind of unpack some of it. But it, it, I love this phrase, and it's kind of at the heart of what I want to share today. And it's this phrase that says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And it's this journey from being servants to being friends. And when we, uh, and, and so it's a journey because the disciples at one point presumably were, in Jesus' eyes, servants. And I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. There's a journey that happens here. Is there, there's a transition that happens. And sometimes when we come to our faith, uh, we come to Jesus at first, the thing that we do to put our trust in Jesus is often to call him Lord. And to call Jesus Lord is to, is to say he's the master. He's the one who is Lord over my life. He's the one who I am, uh, I'm here to serve. And that's often the, the kind of journey into, into faith where we make Jesus Lord. You know, we do, we do start from that place as servants. But what this passage does is it invites us on a journey to not stay in that place. We need to move from those who simply obey without knowledge to those who relate as friends. And I, I kind of frame it not as a journey that we kind of go from one land and, and move on to another land. Rather, it's like having a foundation which we then build upon. So we start as servants and, and that doesn't actually change. There's other places in the Bible that talks us about us being servants of God. There's a sense in which that doesn't change. But what happens is we build on top of that. And on top of that is this journey of being friends with God. And the passage is full of uh, contrasts. I don't know if you noticed this. It's full of the contrast between a master and a servant and a father and a friend. It's got these contrasting words. And Jesus is making a point here. He's talking about the transition from uh, viewing God as a master to viewing God as a father and us relating to God as servants and us relating to God as friends. Now, the topic of being a, a, a the word friend is used throughout the New Testament and it's, it's it, when, as what happens when you translate something from one language to another, the word that we often have in our translations for friend within the New Testament is potentially three different Greek words. So there's, there's three words that are used throughout the New Testament and, and are phrased friend. So if you read the word friend in your Bible, it might mean different things. So the first uh, kind of uh, 
level of relationship, if you like, is this idea of an associate. There's this word, which I, I don't speak Greek, so I, I won't tell you what the word is, but it's heteros or something like that. And, and it's this idea of like a comrade, a, someone who's alongside, an associate, someone you're working with. And this is the word um, that Jesus uses to Judas. He says, when Judas comes to, uh, brings the soldiers to arrest him. And he says, do what you came for, friend. That's the word that's used there. It's kind of like a kind of just casual uh, friend. The next one has a kind of connotations of loyalty. You know, there's a, a it's, it's like being loyal to someone, that kind of friendship that has a depth of loyalty and a, a, a companion. It says, you know, Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It's like he came alongside the tax collectors and sinners. It's, it's, there's a sense of loyalty, kind of putting yourself alongside. And that's the word that's being used here. It says, I no longer call you servants, but... Uh, this word, Greek word philos, I call, I call you friends. And then there are other places in the New Testament that use a word that's even deeper uh, for the word friend, and it's sometimes in some translations translated as friend. And it's the word for affection. Paul uses it uh, to the church in um, Philippi. Um, it's the same word that's used for this is my beloved son. Beloved is, the, is, the, is sometimes translated friend. This is my beloved son. It means esteemed, dear, favorite, worthy. Paul uses it when he talks about Timothy. Paul uses it in this kind of affectionate way for Timothy. So it's just a little bit of background to kind of help you see that when you see the word friend in your New Testament, it, it has different levels of relationship it implies. So we're going to um, just look briefly at some of the people in the Bible that are uh, friends of God and just see if there's anything that we can learn from them. So the first person is Abraham. In James uh, chapter 2, verses 23, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. What an incredible thing to have, you know, to be called God's friend. And it, it says uh, also in Isaiah 40, verse 8, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. How awesome to have God call you friend. And we, we don't have time to obviously unpack the whole journey of Abraham, but that's one of the characteristics that stands out for uh, the authors of the Bible when they reflect on the story of Abraham. And one of the really fascinating and challenging passages that comes up is in Genesis 18. And as part of this journey that, that God and Abraham are going through, this friendship, if you like, it comes to this point where we will have all heard of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where it's a city where God decides that this, this city has too much evil in it. We're going to have to do something about that. I'm going to wipe out the city. And Abraham hears about this because it says that God told him. God comes to him and tells him, this is what I'm going to do, which is also an incredible fact. Like He went and told Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. So let's read it from uh, Genesis 18, verse 17. I'll just read a few verses. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised. So I love that, you know, shall I hide from Abraham? Like Abraham is, is like when God was looking for his plans on how he was going to unfold his whole plans for humanity, he looked for someone who could be his friend. And what is fascinating in that passage is that what happens is he comes to Abraham and, and he says to Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, in his relationship with God, feels free to go back to him and says, God, what about if there's 50 righteous people in the city? Now you're waiting on the thunderbolts and lightning to strike him at this point. You're like, you little what? <laughs> but no, God says, if there's 50, I will not do it. And they, they go through this fascinating conversation and it goes, and, and he basically is bartering with God. And it's like, well, what, 45 and 30? And, it, and he gets it all the way down to 10. 
And God still goes with it. And, and I, part of me wonders if Abraham had kept going, would, have God, would God have kept going? We don't know. But isn't that a fascinating thing, that God actually invited Abraham's influence? I don't know if you've thought about that. That God has, is like, well, I've got plans. This is what I'd like to do. But I'll tell Abraham. And then Abraham goes, God, actually, have you thought about this? Which is, often sounds like a really dangerous thing to say to God. Have you thought about this? What about these righteous people? And, and he, he pushes back. God actually invited Abraham to influence how he was going to operate in the world. And in the context of this being, us being friends of God, so often we, can want, we want to be like robots. Just tell us what to do, God. But what we see in people like Abraham is that they actually, it's a partnership. They actually speak to God and say, what about this? And we have the kind of God who actually listens to that. So that's Abraham. David. David isn't specifically referred to as a friend of God, but what we do know from the Bible is that he was referred to as a man after God's own heart. Acts 13, 22. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Fascinating. Again, David's life, we see the, this, the ups and downs of David's life, the journey that he um, goes through. And I think we could quite confidently say he was a friend of God. And we see that at times he had to lean on God when he's in a place of desperation and loneliness. And we have some of it captured in the Psalms when we read about the, the pain and the anguish that David goes through. But who is his faithful friend through it all? It's God. And I think um, it's this testimony that God has about David. It's just incredible. And, and I love the idea that Jesus forever will be called the son of David. That, that one of the names of Jesus is the son of David. What an honor. What a special place David must have had in God's heart to say, well, my son, when he comes, people will refer to him as the son of David. What an incredible thing. God uh, basically saw David and said, well, this man represents my heart well. And we know the story of David. We know it wasn't all up and to the left. It wasn't all perfect and it didn't all go right for him. Things go wrong. But God still says, this was a man after my heart. There was trust. And then Moses, Exodus 33, 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Now Moses spends a lot of time with God, developing that relationship, 40 days on a mountain. And we know the result of it. We know the, you know, the Ten Commandments come down the mountain. But there was 40 days. It didn't take 40 days for God to, to tell him the Ten Commandments. 40 days in the presence of God. And face to face, this picture here, it speaks of intimacy. It speaks of a, a, a kind of understanding, a shared understanding. You know, when you look into someone's eyes and you're face to face with them, there's a, there's a level of intimacy, there's a level of um, getting to know them. And when we read the phrase, the presence of God in the Old Testament, you know, sometimes that's how it's translated. It talks about the presence of God. Well, it literally, like the, the Hebrew words literally mean God's face, before God's face. So when you're reading about the presence of God, we think in, often in these abstract terms like uh, the glory clouds, or we think of like the, the floatiness of God being somewhere in the atmosphere. But the word literally means God's face, before God's face. That's what it means when the Bible talks about the presence of God. And Moses was a friend of God. So I want to help us think about what does it mean to be a friend of God. And I want to pick some perhaps unlikely characteristics, some from these passages and from some of the characters we're looking at here. I want to pick some unlikely things, not the, not the things you would uh, expect if I said to you, what is it to be a friend of God? So the first one is this, 
uh, a friend of God, friends of God think alike. There's something about being a friend of God means that you start to think like God. And this is the journey that it talks about in um, Romans 12 of having our minds renewed. Be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Now, we know this in, in practice that in general, the people that you are close with, your friends, generally speaking, on the important topics, probably think alike. Most of the time, we do not like hanging out with people who think totally different from us, if we're honest. We gather around people who think similarly to us. Take churches, take um, friendship groups, social groups. Of course, there are exceptions, but in general, we like to be around people who think similarly to us. And we are called to represent God into the world. And to do that, we're called his ambassadors. We are Christ's ambassadors. And that means that we go and represent him to others. And if we're going to represent him to others, we need to think like him. We need to see like him. We need to understand how he thinks. A good ambassador is somebody who already knows what the person who sent them is thinking. They can represent them. They understand their heart. In a a unique situation they haven't planned for, they can go, I think I know what this person would do here. That is what it means to be an ambassador. And of course, there's still the direct line back to HQ when you're an ambassador. But there's, there's an invitation for ambassadors to represent the one that they're sent. And this is what we see in David. You know, he was a man after God's own heart, which is to say he understood something about how God operates. He wasn't just mirroring behavior. He actually understood God's heart. What an incredible thought. Next one, another kind of slightly unlikely thing to come out of our passage, that friends obey. Now, you probably don't think about this with your friends. Both servants and friends obey. They just have very different motives. If you have a servant and you tell them, you know, fetch me some water, they do it because, well, it's their job. Perhaps they're worried about getting in trouble. They might lose um, status. They might get kicked out. They might get beaten. There's a, there's a fear-based response. If I turn to Joe and say, Joe, would you mind getting me some water? <laughs> Most of the time, most of the time she will. If a friend turns to you and says, could you help me out with something? We do it. As long as it's in our power, we do it. And it's still obedience. It's just obedience out of love. It's obedience out of a a desire to do it. Not an obedience out of I'm going to get in trouble if I don't. It's an obedience out of love. Love. And we we see this in uh, the promises that were given to Abraham. And and God says this, because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him. And we know this in Abraham's life. You know the extreme examples of Abraham and Isaac. What a story that is. And, And Abraham was known as the father of faith. And faith is trust. And that trust that he has in God is shown through his obedience. And it comes up in the passage that we read in John. It it, it sounds strange to our Western ears almost, but you are my friends if you do what I command. There's two ways to read that. There's one way which is like, well, God sounds a little bit like a dictator. We can get close to him if we just do the right things. That is not what this passage is saying when we read it in the context. And particularly when we then realize the command just before he's told us what the command is you're my friends if you do what I command and what is the command? My command is this love each other as I have loved you so you're my friends if you love because when you love you're actually expressing what God is like to others so it comes back to some of the other things we've talked about so friends obey and the way we we love others brings us into a deeper relationship with God. So our friendship with God is impacted by the way we love other people around us. It reveals that our heart is after God's. 
So there's a difference between having a fear-based obedience and a love-based one. You'll be familiar with uh, 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So to be a friend of God is to, is to obey out of love. Next one. Friends are loyal. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. There's a sense of loyalty that comes with being a friend of God. It's like, yep, God, I've got your back. Not that he needs our back. But yes, God, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm for you. A loyalty that comes from love. I love this story um, of David. Uh, I love the whole kind of concept of David having his mighty men. Have you heard of these men? There's David uh, spends some time in a cave and disillusionment and depression. And, and what he ends up doing is gathering all these people around him who are also a bit disaffected and burnt out. And out of this group forms this, this, these people that are sometimes called the mighty men. These, these warriors, people who were strong and would fight for David, but who were also fiercely loyal. And there's just this tiny little story in the midst of it in 2 Samuel. And, it, and, and David's just talking about how, you know, he's living in a cave, he's living out in the wilderness. And he says, I just long for the water from the well at Bethlehem. Just pass it, like a passing comment almost, like, oh, I wish we could just be over there. And, and what does, um, three of his men hear him and go, that's what he wants. So they, like, it's like one verse in the Bible and, and they, they break through the Philistine camp, go through the Philistine camp, go all the way through the enemies, get all the way to, um, to Bethlehem, find the well, get the water, and bring it all the way back to David. Because he makes this passing comment about, I really wish I could have the water. And, and I just love that. I mean, it would be a great film, wouldn't it? It would be a great movie, that one. But these were people who were... Um, who were loyal to David, who loved him, that nothing was too much. And I love the journey they go on from being disgruntled and depressed to being these, these, these warriors for David. They were willing to lay down their life. And, and the thing that kind of built up that kind of loyalty would be the history, the, the journey they had walked together. And so often that's true in our walk with God as well, that we become friends as we journey with God and invite him into the experience of our lives. It's true in our human relationships and it's true in our relationship with God. And then the last one to mention today is that friends confide. A safe place to confide in. You know, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything I learned from my father I have made known to you. What a challenging thought. That Jesus turns to them and says, you know, I've not held anything back. Everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. Friends confide. And when we're friends with God, he confides in us and we confide in him. As I was uh, researching and studying this, I came across someone saying this. Friends confide in one another. And Christ considers us to be such good friends of his that he is able to confide in us and share all the plans, hopes, and dreams he and the Father have for us and mankind. He says that all that he has heard of the Father he has made known to us. Now, depending on the degree of our friendship with others, we tend to hold back certain information. There are very few people we share everything with. Only our closest friends get that treatment. But Christ is demonstrating here that he considers us his closest and most sympathetic friends. What a thought. And then and coming back to the story we already looked at in Genesis 18 with Abraham, when God says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Is that in our view of God that he's thinking to himself, will I hide myself from, from these people that I love, my friends? So one of the things that comes out of this passage in John is, is the way that it ends. And, and I would summarize that in, in this phrase, which is, intimacy brings authority. John 15, 
7, it says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. And it also says in verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Now, these... um, These verses, there's loads of them in in the New Testament, are always deeply challenging to me. Because if you're anything like me, you suddenly go, what, anything? That new Lamborghini, maybe a bit conspicuous, parked outside the high school there, but but there's still a deep truth within this. And we have to read verses like that within the context in which they're given. And the context here is very much, like I say, intimacy brings authority. That for those that God calls friends, those who have developed that relationship with him, in that process, they have begun to think like God. They've had their values shaped by God. They've had uh, time with God. And so the very desires, the things that they ask God for have been formed by their relationship with God. So you have Abraham asking God for um, if there's 10 if there's 20, you know. And and I believe that that is an example of his desire was being shaped by God. Like God actually didn't want people to perish. What he was doing in that moment was he was reflecting the heart of God. This verse about anything you ask, it will be done for you. This is addressed to friends. Those who don't relate to God as servants, but as friends. And it might surprise you, but God really values your thoughts, ideas, and questions. He really values them. He wants to hear them. And again, we can fall into this trap of thinking like, God, I just want you to tell me what to do. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. And we, we often do this when we have big decisions to make. It's like, God, just tell me which one's the right one. Because obviously there's a right and a wrong. And we say, God, which, which of those two, A or B? Let me make it easy for you. We'll do the whole um, uh, putting out the, um, what's it called, the sheep's fleece. That's the word. I couldn't find the word there. They're putting out the fleece uh, to God, and we find ways to kind of get God to toss the coin with us and to decide on things. I just think sometimes that's how God works. Sometimes in his mercy, that's how he meets us. But I think, you'd be surprised if that's how your friend's related to you. He actually wants to hear your thoughts and your ideas and, and your values. And not every decision is, is, is like a robotic yes or no. Sometimes he's like, well, what do you think? What would you like to do? I remember on our journey studying in the States that it came to a point where we had to decide, are we going back to the UK after one year or are we going to stay for two years and we were uh, obviously in a school studying ministry so we had to be like hear from God we've really got to hear from God on this like so we're like spent weeks like God what are you saying are we doing another year here are we doing another year and nothing we're hearing nothing we're like what is going on we've got no clarity about what to do and then somebody who's very wise I think just uh, said to us what would you like to do and it And as soon as they said that, God started speaking to us and saying, actually, I want you to choose. Like, I'm quite happy with your choice. It's not that one's good and one's bad. It's it's, you have choices here. And sometimes we just want the black or white, the answer. But sometimes God's saying, you choose. I want to see what's in you. I want to see what your desires are. I want to see what excites you. And that's what relationship looks like. And... It's not the full story, but part of the whole reason that the law came in the Old Testament was out of our desire to ask God to make it really black and white for us, please. Would you just make it really clear? And we see this in different places throughout the Old Testament where God invites the whole people to come to the mountain of God in Sinai and they say, actually, Moses, would you do it on our behalf? Would you? And we'd like to relate to God through Uh, rules and laws and things that are really easy for us to understand but what we see in this passage in John is that God's looking for something else he's looking for a people who are friends 
And being a friend of God should challenge everything about us. It's, it's, it's like an honor that causes us to not want to mistreat the friendship. Because when we understand the depth of love we're being invited into, it causes us to pause and say, wow. But ultimately, God is inviting us into a depth of relationship to not relate to him as servants, but to relate to him as friends. I'm going to invite the band to come up and and get themselves ready just as I I pray. Lord, I, I thank you for your incredible word. It challenges us deeply that we... Uh, could be your friends, God, is such a deeply radical, transforming thought, God. And we come to you not understanding it all, but just saying, God, show us more of what it means to be your friend. And we thank you for the times in our own lives where you've been a friend, you've come along, you've provided, you've comforted, you've helped us. God, show us again what it is to be your friend to be those you actually in, you want to hear our thoughts and our ideas. Help us to uh, be those who obey you out of love, not out of fear of punishment. And I pray that you would do that by just making your love more of a reality in our lives. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm so glad that you could uh, watch along with us. And hopefully you found Uh, something of God's presence in your life through the service today, something of God's truth that can impact us. And I pray that you have an abundantly blessed week. Uh, Please do get in touch if you want to find out more about us as a church or if you want to come uh, on a Sunday, you'd be very welcome to visit us. Bless you and we'll see you soon.